Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron here, New Life Pentecostal Church, Albany, Georgia. I hope you're having a great day in Jesus. We're going to go over some things with apostolic history today. And, uh, you know, I did a little review on this a while back. And we're going to go over some Tom Weiser books. Just kind of a all-in-one thing, some things I've kind of written down myself here. Here's some Brother Weiser books. I don't know if I can get these all to stand up like that. Early Baptist preaching, Acts 38. A lot of Baptists preached Acts 38. Whoa! There it went. I wonder if I've ever done a review on a history of baptism by Robert Robinson. I think I did when we first started the channel. I just reminded that by the history of baptism by Tom Weiser. And uh, then we'll also kind of go over, and we're not just going to review the books. We're going to take a, a look at like apostolic history. A lot of people, you know, one of the things, I just did this Facebook Live thing Saturday, September 29th with Mark August. And he said one of the questions he gets all the time is that there were no oneness Pentecostals before uh, 1914. Well, even then, I mean, if they're saying it started at the Arroyo Seco camp meeting with uh, Sheppy running through the camp meeting after McAllister preached, saying, I see it, I see it. Well, people then were saying, oh, he's just teaching the same thing as Dr. Such and Such. I think it was Watson or somebody. So, I mean, they were there and they're all over the place. It's like I, I told him, I said, it's like, okay, history is written by the victors. And so somebody takes 90% of a puzzle away and says we demand you show us what the puzzle is well we can do the best we can so we'll start with early baptist preaching acts 238 i'm surprised i didn't bring down william richards oneness baptist who thomas jefferson had preach yes they used to hold sunday services in the house of representative no separation of church and state was there was there and so oneness uh preacher william richards tom good friends of thomas jefferson spoke there twice um so cover francis cornwell passing out pamphlets outside of westminster abbey in london cornwell of course one of the great figures in baptist theological uh, history, Francis Cornwell. That's not Brother Cornwell. Maybe it's some relation, though. Wouldn't that be cool? The uh, superintendent for Kansas, Brother Cornwell, Merrill Cornwell. What a great preacher he is. You ought to get videos he's done. He did like exploring God's Word videos that are all over YouTube. But uh, so Cornwell one of the great 17th century theologians of the Baptist. Um, and then John Saltmarsh, uh, 1645, Smoke in the Temple, Anabaptism, so called. Okay, that the baptism of Jesus Christ by water was uh, onely in the name of Jesus Christ as appears in all places where such baptism is practiced, including Romans 6 3, all of which is a baptism only, or onely as they would say it then, in the name of Jesus Christ. That the form which they baptize is a baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost is a form of man's devising a tradition of man, a mere consequence, John, from supposition, prone about uh, probability, and not a form left by Christ. Christ. So Saltmarsh writes this book, Smoke in the Temple, and he's got a subheading, Anabaptism. What is Anabaptist? What do they believe? They believe in baptism in Jesus' name. This is the 1600s, okay, 1645. Then Mercurius Politicus, 1659, leading Baptist nonconformist Kiffin, Moyer, etc., wrote a short message in Mercurius Politicus. The humble and hearty address to sundry churches of persons baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So in 1659, Mercurius Politicus newspaper, um, Kiffin and Moyer and other Baptist nonconformists said we're writing people baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so now we come to Baptist Confessions of Faith. Brother Weiser, by the way, keep him in prayer. Last I heard he was very sick. I don't know any of the details out in Fort Worth. But... Uh, 
The early English Baptists were roughly divided among two types. The particular Baptists who followed Calvinistic principles and uh, general Baptists who believed in general redemption. Obviously anybody could be saved. So in the 17th century many confessions appeared in the nonconformist. A few of these included provision for Jesus' name, baptism. A particular Baptist confession, First Baptist, first published in 1656, entitled A Confession of the Faith of Several Churches of Christ in the County of Somerset and some churches in the counties near adjacent, said the following about baptism. Okay, so this is a 1656 uh, Baptist Confession of Faith for Somerset and adjacent counties, that it is the duty of every man and woman that have repented from dead works and have faith toward God to be baptized. Acts 2, 38, 8, 12, 37, 38. That is, dipped or buried under the water. Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12. In the name of our Lord Jesus, Acts 8, 16, or in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So you see, they allowed for either, but they started with Jesus' name, baptism. Then in 1654, the true gospel faith or what Whitley calls the earliest General Baptist Confession of Faith does not mention Trinitarian baptism at all. Only baptism in Jesus' name is mentioned. Lumpkin, in his Baptist Confessions of Faith, does a poor job of giving us a facsimile of Article 11. He neglects to quote scriptures cited and cites the wrong scripture twice in his work. He lists Acts 10.43 and 2.33. In the original, it's 10.48 and 2.38. Here's what it says in the original Baptist Confessions of Faith, Article 11, 1654. Okay. That they believe the things so preached ought to be dipped in water, or immersed, dipped. Acts 10.47. <coughs> and then it quotes it. And then Acts 10.48 quotes that. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 2.41. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. Acts 8.12. But they that believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. So the earliest, the very earliest Baptist confession of faith according to Baptist historians, advocated only baptism in the name of Jesus, which is fascinating. But it was also Calvinistic, uh, which is interesting in its own right. So later, the General Baptist in 1660 published a brief confession, and it says this about baptism, that the right and only way of gathering churches according to Christ's appointment, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, that's in parentheses, is first to teach or preach the gospel, Mark 16, 16, to the sons and daughters of men, and then to baptize, that is in English, to dip in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, such only as they must profess repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 2, 38, Acts 8, 12, Acts 8, 8, 18, 8. So notice again, it allows for either in this particular case, but it's not exclusive for Matthew 28, 19, but really pushes the Jesus name, at least in an equal uh, part. Okay, in another part of the same confession, qualifications for the ministry are outlined. And... Uh, it says, it says this about those they considered unqualified. All such who come not first to repent of their sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and so baptized in His name for their mission of sins, but are only brought up in the schools of human learning to the attaining human arts and a variety of languages with many vain curiosities of speech, seeking rather to gain large revenues than the gain of souls. Okay, so obviously here it says basically if you're not baptized in Jesus, Jesus name you are not uh, this is 1660 general Baptist which was not Calvinistic confession of faith that you're not ready to uh, be a minister now William Wall this is a fact I need to find this it's boxed up probably somewhere in his work the history of infant baptism says this about the general Baptist um, because this, the debates on pedo baptism back in these days, they're writing massive tomes about it, and uh, you know the pedo Baptist or infant Baptist baptism had a little more uh, theological arguments in their arsenal than I thought. In uh, Stillwater's revival books, I used to get all these every month. I'd get a certain amount that I could spend a little on in books, and I would go to Stillwater's revival books when they were reaping. Now everything's computerized. Ah. Okay, 
So the General Baptist, William Wall, authority. One sort of them do count it indifferent whether they baptize with these words in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit or with these in the name of the Lord Jesus and do in their public confession allow either forms. And I have heard that some of them do affectedly choose the latter. So he's saying that General Baptist you can baptize Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or Jesus' name, but some really contend for the Jesus name formula. Uh, later, he says, those that baptize only in the name of the Lord Jesus plead the examples of the apostles, Acts 8, 16 and 19, 15. Now, John Lawrence, Moshim, and now I will say this, like friend, Moshim, I, I can't even go into all the ones, uh, maybe the big noy. Uh, that really promote the apostolic message. It uh, says this about the General Baptist in his in ecclesiastical history. They dip only once and not three times as is practiced elsewhere. The candidates for baptism and considered a matter of indifference whether the sacrament be administered in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost or in the name of Christ alone. Most shame great Lutheran if I remember correctly, Lutheran historian. He also says some good things about uh, oneness, you know, Sabellianism in there. But again, he says that you could be baptized either way. The Godhead. Among these early Baptists, many became satis dissatisfied with the idea of three persons in God. Bali, in his work Anabaptism, 1646, writes, The Anabaptist in Somersetshire denied the trinity of persons in the deity and affirmed that there is but one person in the Godhead. For if there be three persons, there must be three gods, and that Athanasian in his and Athanasius in his creed doth blaspheme. Around the same time, Thomas Edwards published his Gangrena, he said that there were those in England who believed the following, that the unity of the Godhead, there is not a trinity of persons, but the doctrine of the trinity believed and professed in the church of God is a popish tradition and doctrine of Rome. There are not three distinct persons in the divine essence, but only three offices. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are not three persons, but offices. There is but one person in the divine nature. So that's around 1646. They're saying there's a bunch of oneness people around. The confessions that appeared in the 17th century or the 1600s give us a good clue to a group's concepts on the Godhead. If they were Trinitarian, they usually express this explicitly in their confession. That has been my experience. All those I mentioned in the previous chapter do not make an explicit stand for Trinitarianism. Uh, this may mean a lot or not much, depending on how you look at it. Um, in my research, I came across a very interesting cover-up that should mean a lot to any honest historian. Richard Knight, a pastor of a General Baptist church in Rhode Island in the 19th century, wrote a history of the General Baptist. In it, he goes to great lengths to, pa to paint the General Baptist movement in a Trinitarian light. Either Mr. Knight was hopelessly, hopelessly ignorant of the true contents of the Confession of 1660, or he is what is commonly referred to in the Bible as a liar. Mr. Wright writes the following, The Confession of 1660 speaks plainly, There is one Holy Spirit, the precious gift of God, freely to give to such as obey Him, on and on and so forth. We believe there is one Holy Spirit, the third person assisting in the sacred trinity. Okay, so... He goes on to say all this, I have not been able to find the above in any reproductions of the Confession of 1660. This is what it really says. There is one Holy Spirit, the precious gift of God, given freely to such as obey Him, that hereby, <coughs> that thereby they may be thoroughly sanctified and may be able without which they are altogether unable to abide steadfast in the faith and the honor of the Father and His Son, Christ, the author and finisher of their faith. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, which spirit of promise have not, uh, such have not yet received, though they speak much of Him, that are so far out of love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, and temperance, free of the Spirit, as they that breathe out much cruelty. So, the truth of the matter is, the General Baptists as a whole were never strongly Trinitarian. There were Trinitarians among them, but they never seemed to gain the majority. Corbett, as a matter of fact, says this about the General Baptist. There was among them, however, some confusion with respect to the Trinitarian concept of God. By 1750, they had adopted a quite generally a form of Unitarian teaching that explained deity as one person in three manifestations. So, General Baptist in 1750, he's saying, over the course of time, had developed and had become oneness. Yes, that is exactly right. Um, 
The term Unitarian first, Unitarian first emerges in 1682 and it appears in the title of the Brief History, 1687. It was considered in a broad sense to cover all, whatever differences they held, the universality of the divine being. Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition. Watts tells us about these General Baptists. In 1697, the General Baptist Assembly resolved that its members debated the Trinity. They must do so in scripture words and terms and no other terms. The assembly held that the position consistently throughout the following century. So you couldn't say first person, second person, third person, co equal, co eternal, things like that. Um, in 1678, an opposing confession to the Confession of 1660 was published. It was issued not by the General Assembly, but by 55 messengers, elders, and brethren. They were chiefly from the counties of Bucks, Hereford, Bedford, and Oxford. They titled it the Orthodox Creed. The Catholic Encyclopedia says about it, the most important document of the General Baptist was the Orthodox Creed of 1678, explicitly affirming accepting of the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creeds. This document set forth the theological views of the General Baptist in details. Um, it does not, however, appear that it was ever generally uh, approved. So that's fascinating. Let's just do a couple more things. We don't want this to go too far out. Salter's Hall. Okay. Um, in the early 18th century, there was a desire to unify themselves on the subject of the Godhead among nonconformists. You have to remember, like, Daniel Defoe was a nonconformist. Um, John Milton was a nonconformist. Isaac Watts was a nonconformist. Uh, Isaac Newton was a nonconformist. John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, was basically a nonconformist. Okay, so. In hopes of an agreement, a meeting was held at Salter's Hall in London, February 19th and 24th, 1719. The main question considered by the delegates was whether or not to subscribe to extra-biblical statements regarding the Godhead. Most of the General Baptists present did not subscribe, because remember, by 1750, they were basically oneness. Crosby tells us in this assembly, when some Baptist ministers pleaded against subscription to human forms, they were approached with the names of laymen and Anabaptist teachers and told they had no business there. Michael Watts in his work The Dissenter says about the London ministers, okay, and on a crucial division it was resolved by 57 to 53 votes that no human compositions and interpretations of the doctrine of the Trinity should be made a part of those articles of advice. He continues, meanwhile in London the controversy continued in a further meeting at Salter's Hall on March 3rd. The defeated minority subscribed their names to a Trinitarian declaration, which led henceforth to two sides being known as subscribers and non-subscribers. So you see the majority said we don't believe in the Trinity. Or if we do, we're not going to use language. Okay. Um, that say this. Uh, do, 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 do. It goes into showing who's what there. It goes into Francis Cornwell. Okay, Cornwell trained up at Cambridge, Emanuel College, commenced Master of Arts at the University. Francis Cornwell, M.A., Minister of Martin and Kent, and went under imprisonment in King Charles the first time for nonconformity to wearing the surplus or kneeling at the sacraments to cross at baptism and all this other stuff. Okay, Mr. Cornwell taking the scriptures to be the only rule of faith. Um, so then after the death of King Charles I, Oliver Cromwell gave liberty to all worship God according to their own consciences. So Cornwell begins to preach again. So Mr. Cornwell, while vicar of the Church of England in Marden, became convinced of believers' baptism. Um, and it goes into this. Okay. Another practice that was at first rejected by General Baptist was the laying on of hands. The practice of laying on of hands, apparently, for the reception of the Holy Ghost, was later widely accepted by the General Baptist. Our Mr. Cornwell had a great part in the introduction of this practice among General Baptist. So... So he's, he's believing in receiving the Holy Ghost, laying on of hands. Okay, so what is the everlasting gospel? He's got two questions. Whether they preach now the everlasting gospel in the same manner that inquire after it as Peter did to the trembling Jews, Acts 2.38. So in his work, Mr. Cornwell identifies himself as a loyal covenanter for pure reformation in England and Ireland according to the word of God. Um... 
and he quotes Luke 24, 40, 60, 48. Um, over and over in this short work, Mr. Cornwell refers to Acts 2.38 as the everlasting gospel. Now, in William Tyndale's The Obedience of the Christian Man, he does the same thing. I've done a video on that where he says, what are the keys to the kingdom? What's the keys to the everlasting gospel? Acts 2.38. Now, you had in his time, Tyndale's time, people writing under Tyndale's name that wasn't Tyndale. Same with Erasmus. So then you have to begin to discover what did Tyndale and Erasmus actually write. But they wrote, uh, in his case, the obedience to the Christian man. Okay. Until you yield obedience unto the gospel commandment, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. This is Cornwall, again, Cornwall, for their mission of sins, Acts 2.38. Because it is written that he saith, I know him, that is Jesus Christ, keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and there is no truth in him. He, menace, he mentions the keys to the kingdom of Matthew 16.19 on page 1. Over and over, he reiterates that a true gospel minister confessed that Jesus is the Christ as Peter did in Matthew. Um, a modern oneness Pentecostal could hand this out if we print in a tract explaining his basic beliefs on the gospel. The New Testament ratified with the blood of the Lord Jesus. Uh, is the Magna Charter believers in Jesus Christ dipped by which they're justified to be no heretics. All right, and so then it, he's fighting with a Mr. White about all this. Uh, Mr. Cornwell pleads with the English ministry. Or is it Mr. Whittle? Mr. Whittle, excuse me. So he's fighting with Mr. Whittle. Uh, so anyhow, and it's just got tons on here from that. Now this is just one book. Here's a list of the bibliography here. Some of you may be interested in this bibliography. And then we'll just uh, show you a couple other things. I can't believe, did I? I wonder if I've got Williams Richards, Oneness Baptist. But also remember, like, Robert Robinson was a Oneness Baptist in the 1770s. So uh, I'm going to write myself a note that I have already done this on this first day of October 2019. So let's go to Marvin Arnold's Apostolic History Outline. Um, and I'm just going to start reading some stuff. He's got some really good stuff in here. Um, okay, so, and he's got it all referenced out. Okay, AD 2004, Basilides martyred. He held Acts 238. AD 2010, uh, Celts took Acts 2, uh, Acts 2 Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiology to Languedoc, Flanders, Frisian, Saxony, according to Eberhardt and the Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition. 2015, Sibelius in Rome, he was a preacher of Petrine doctrine along with Deuteronomy 6 4. AD 220, Great Notius, Patripassion died. By AD 200, hundreds of thousands of such minded men, notions were nicknamed allogi, and such bodies there continued Holy Spirit, tongue speaking gifts of the Spirit, etc. This apostolic doctrine was in Europe, Eurasia, Asia, including China and North Africa, according to Otto Heick and M.T. Kelsey. Um, the Jerusalemic religion was dominant. Tongue speaking gifts of the Spirit were denied by the Catholic system. Uh, Tertullian <coughs> declared. Uh, that tongue-speaking monarchians outnumbered Catholics. Um, in AD 370, according to R.A. Knox, there were few Catholics in Africa. That's fascinating. By 370, um, 240, Manny, born, born in Persia, was a Judaic Christian. He both hated and badly smeared, defamed by Catholics and their historians. He baptized in Jesus' name, New Glossolalia, and kept the Feast of Pentecost. It was oneness Pentecostalism, but had a stigma. Later, the stigma was removed, blunt and loud. Um, he's, now, he lumps Paul of Samoseta as a uh, oneness, an avid Patripassian Catholics called him a Sabellian, Blunt 515. Paul held the Godhead without distinctions. Um, Samo Satan, Armenian Christianity was alive in 15, 
51, according to George Hunston Williams, page 677. Of course, George Hunston Williams was the famed Harvard professor. Was he dean of theology then? I think he was at Harvard, who got the Holy Ghost um, at the hands of a oneness minister. So when I say at the hands, it was uh, somebody laying his hands on it. Okay. Um, donatism. Now, he would say donatism. And I don't think it was totally, but he says was, you know, he paints with a broad brush. Was a Sabellianism or Patripassianism. It never died. In AD 350, Donatus had 400 churches and as many ordained uh, bishops that immersed in the name Jesus Christ. And that's Historian Blunt 127 and Verdun, pages 30 and 258. Okay, then he does qualify that there were some that didn't believe that, that claimed to be Donatist. Okay. Biblical Christianity continued in Monarchian, Patripatian, Sabaean, and Montanist bodies. They were about the same doctrinally. They held Acts 2. The, ma the major churches of the East were of apostolic origin this time. Um, pay, uh, AD 304, Emperor Diocletian killed Jesus' name people. Albin, Aaron, Julius of Britain of the Glastonbury Church, also Theonis and Secunda, oneness were martyred by agents of Rome, according to Martyr's Mirror, pages 155, which if you don't have Martyr's Mirror by Jacob von Brock, you really need to get it. It's great. Glastonbury Acts 238, faith had continued. Pentecostalism called Montanism pervaded the nations, according to Neander and Knox. Now, Montanism had some weird stuff in it, but a majority of Montanists were oneness. And there's all kind of like Montanist uh, catacombs and graveyards. I've got a book on that. I probably did a review on it years ago. And uh, there were Sabellian in Rome catacombs as well. Northcote wrote that. Was it 1769? Okay. There were continued miracles in tongues. Wolflin, yeah, Wolflane was baptized in Jesus' name according to H. Daniel Rops, page 110. N.C. Eberhardt said he was a one God man, A.D. 320 to 340. Wolfline, Little Wolf, also Oophilus, oh, he's the guy who gave us the Bible in English or Gothic, uh, was one of the greatest of apostolic preachers. He translated the Gothic Bible. He baptized or caused millions among the Indo-European tribes to be immersed in Jesus' name, and he pro practiced glossolalia. Um, so, there's some painting with broad brushes here, but... Um, and I know like Ufalus, you'll, you'll usually hear he was Arian, but a lot of, uh, most Arians baptized in Jesus' name. Um, I'm writing myself some notes here. So that's just out of a couple books. I was going to go through, I got so much stuff here um, that you might find interesting and uh, no, and there's many more, but like Cal Bora's got books. Of course, Marvin Arnold's got a lot more books than this. So does David Bernard. So does Tom Weiser have more books than this. So, uh, and then you've got like Delroy Gale. You've got just enormous amounts of books all over the place. Um, so, yes, there's always been a church. The gates of hell can't prevail against the church. It's been the majority for a lot of history in a lot of areas. We tend to focus on Western Europe. The gospel is everywhere. It went all around the world. I do appreciate Marvin Arnold talking about China. I mean, when Marco Polo got to China, they were shocked. There was already Christians in the emperor's court, things such as that. So, uh, God bless you. We will talk with you later. Just believe Acts 238 and the oneness of God, holiness of life. It's a great thing. It'll get you to heaven. That's the biggest thing. I love you in Jesus' name.